One of the things I've been doing when I've been interviewing these great reps is after we turn the mics off, I go, tell me the best salesperson you know. What I'm trying to do is compound on the guest list. Keep crawling up and around uh, the community of great salespeople. Because I think when you talk to people who are really doing it day after day, uh, who are kind of, you know, not early in their career, but kind of mid-career, where they've learned the lessons the hard way, the things that we're all doing, and we get a different perspective on them. And I think what I've learned is that there's a lot of ways to become great at sales. It needs to match your market. It needs to match your personality. Uh, And there's a lot of ways to skin the cat. I think too many people look at sales as, oh, you got to be a natural, gregarious person. You got to be the killer. You got to be hyper motivated, intense work ethic. There's a recipe, and the recipe is yours. And it's up to us to find that fit for us in our marketplace, within our personality, our desires. Uh, today, we got a great guest who was recommended by a previous guest. And I th- what I like about this is uh, it, it's a personal reputation commitment. On LinkedIn, when I ask, a lot of people just put their friend's name on and I look at it and it's like, oh, they've got two years of sales experience. They're just doing it to flatter their friend. And that's nice, but it ends up wasting a lot of my time and my booker's time. What I want to do is find the real great salespeople, the people who have really done it, the people that other salespeople respect and appreciate. And that's one of the characteristics you're going to hear today. Because I found that a lot of the great killers, that the top performers from a revenue standpoint, tend to be a little bit of a lone wolf. Uh, the people who get into management tend to be much more of a team player, uh, mentor type. And, and there's nothing wrong or right here. It's where you want to go with your career and what lights you up, what excites you as a professional. Let's get into this interview. I'll sum it up at the end because I took away a, a, quite a few lessons here. I think there's a lot in this interview not just about sales, but about career strategy, about interacting with the people within the team, about what to look for in the companies and the industries that you go into. Because we all want to become lucky. Lucky is having success without killing yourself. (laughs) And a a lot of luck happens to be at the right place at the right time. But guess what? We get to the right place at the right time. Uh, you can call it luck, or you can call it uh, strategic planning um, to feel good about it. But one of those elements is connecting and building a network that's also going to those great places. Because guess what? They want to bring you along. Not to be nice, but they know what you can do for them. And setting that situation up as early as you can in your career will basically compound over the years. Let's get into it. Make sure you're checking out our friends over at CoVideo. I think I'm going to release that webinar that I did with CoVideo. There's a lot of gold in there. Too much. Too much to give away for free. But I'm a very generous person. Also, if you're in the courses, listen to the end. Uh, I'll update you on the office hours. Yeah, guess what? Guess who worked two holidays in a row here on office hours? Yeah, guess who? Guess who showed up prepared with great lessons? Stuff that I think you'll help you close more deals, get into more accounts. So go make sure you listen to them because I worked hard. I showed up on two big holidays. That's right. There's, there's no rest for, for the Maverick over here. Uh, check out our friends over at CoVideo. Video emails are crushing it. If you're not applying it in some way, check it out. If you're not using video, we're all doing it today. Uh, you might as well be good at it or better. You know, buy a light, buy a little better camera, $100. Is that too much? 
uh, get a little in, integrated into your email strategy about showing the client what you can do for them, covideo.com. Here we go. Hey, Mike, welcome to the show. As a way of getting started, give us a little feedback on yourself, a little background on yourself. <laughs> hey, Brian, thanks. I appreciate it. Um, I've been in, uh, I've been in sales. I'm out in New York. I've been in software sales for about 13 years now. Uh, I kind of just tripped and fell into it. Um, you know, when I was, when I was in college, I wasn't really looking for, for a sales job. Uh, but it's been a very fun run, uh, brought me from Boston to New York to Chicago to LA and, and back to New York uh, over the last, you know, 12, 13 years. So it's been great. And why sales? Was it just what was available at the time or? So I, uh, great question. Um, you know, I always, I always worked a lot, uh, growing up. Um, I sold, if you were in central Massachusetts, uh, you know, in the late nineties or early two thousands, I probably sold you a cup of, you know, piping hot Dunkin' Donuts coffee. Right. Um, I, I made uh, you know, I built lemonade stands in my neighborhood. I just, I always loved it. Loved, uh, you know, loved talking to people and having conversations with people and getting to understand, you know, what makes them tick. Um, and I, I did really just fall into it. I, I think I was in line for a finance job at a career fair at Bentley university. And this, this gentleman who's now one of my very, very good friends, Brian Scott, looked at my, my name tag and it said that I played, I played soccer and I was the captain of the team and he pulled me out of line and was like, I need to talk to you. And that's how I started my first round of interviews at a company called Blade Logic, um, which, which is, I'm sure you know, you know, a lot of those guys came from PTC in some of those areas, some of those places. So pretty interesting. <laughs> Well, that's it. I saw Bentley and my brother went to Bentley. Oh, no way. That's awesome. Yeah, so I knew it. it's an accounting school, isn't it? Most it, finance. Yeah, finance and accounting. They did just launch a sales school, though. I've, I'm seeing a lot of a right. uh, lot of universities. I see mostly in Texas, but um, pretty exciting that they're doing that at, at Bentley as well. Um, you know, it's something that not a lot of people think about um, as a career. So, you know, and I, I used to work for a PTC VP, so I'm familiar with the culture. <laughs> How did you fit into that? So we started the inside sales team. I was just a BDR. I didn't know what a blade logic was, right? <laughs> um, I, was, I, uh, I, I, I think I interviewed with the CRO, John McMahon, when I was like 22 years old and had no idea how, you know, this legend that I was interviewing with. I just didn't know. I didn't, oh. yeah, he was great in the meeting and um, I just, didn't know what I didn't know. And, and, uh, you know, got to learn from a lot of the greats. Um, the culture there was, was, was actually pretty good. Um, you know, it was heavy focused on process around medic and, you know, three wise and, you know, force management and all, all that stuff. Right. Which I'm sure you, you could talk about in your sleep. Right. Um, and so it was just a great experience to, you know, a young, very young age, just get surrounded by not just those those processes, but just the people that truly believed in, in implementing them, right? And yeah. and focus on solving a problem instead of just selling a, a feature. And, and then you get gobbled up by a huge company. Yep, get gobbled up by a big company, uh, the, the behemoth BMC software, which had this like wheel of just tons of different products and solution yeah. sets that solve all these kind of different things. And Blade Logic just was like one thing. And so just having to evolve and learn and, and understand new uh, solutions and problems that we can solve. It was very, very cool and interesting. Um, and then from there, just, you know, moved my way up and got my shot. Um, you know, I got a call to move to Chicago. I'd never been to Chicago. And they were just <laughs> like, hey, do you want to interview for a rep job in Chicago, out full outside sales? And I was like, sure, let's do it. And uh, then I moved to Chicago and the rest is history. Hey, so. What was that like? Because, you know, I had done it. Like when you leave kind of what you're used to and you go to a whole nother geography, you were probably young and it was an exciting, right? Yeah. Uh, you, you have to evolve and adapt, right? Yeah. Uh, it's kind of what makes it fun. Change is, is constant. And that is really what, what makes not just this job, but I think life fun in general. Um, you know, every two years I kind of look around and I've, I've always had this just like, hey, should I, you know, maybe move somewhere? Or like, am I, am I comfortable? Or should I maybe push myself to do something new and, and become a little bit more uncomfortable to learn, right? Um, and Chicago, I, I did Boston and New York for two years and then they, I got the call and I got the interview for a real outside software sales rep job at 25, 26 years old. Like you're going hard at that job, yeah. right? 
And so what, what, what was that like? Because you go from pounding the phones to meeting people in person. It was uh, it was an experience. Obviously, I didn't start out with the premier account list. Um, <laughs> right? Give you the cherries. Uh, no, uh, I just I just focused on the basics and what I knew, which was you know constant activity with purpose, right? Not just blind activity, but purposeful activity where you're you're finding the right people to call on. You're understanding you know how they tick and what things might they be looking to accomplish. You're making deposits in those people not just calling them blindly and selling them a, you know, a widget, right? You're constantly understanding and making deposits, not thinking about the sale immediately, but maybe 12 months, 18 months down the road, two years, three years, lifetime, right? Whatever it is. Um, so, so really just constant activity, finding the right people, doing the work that, that is required up front. So if you think about mapping out the org charts, yeah. uh, mapping out the value pyramid of, you know, you know, what, what is the company do all the way down to the benefits that we might be, be able to deliver to help them solve real problems and who cares about that? Um, so, so all the stuff I was taught, the only difference was I was doing the meetings in person. And so I screwed up a ton of meetings, a ton of meetings, but had fun with it and learned as much as I could. Um, you know, and I wasn't afraid to tell them when I was screwing up the meeting. And what was the difference from your perspective? <clears throat> I think it's, uh, you know, being able to be on your feet um, command, commanding the message was, was critical, yeah. right. Uh, doing your research very like on everyone that's going to be in the room, you know, no matter how well you prepare, something's going to go wrong. Like the projector won't work right. or, uh, the meeting room is booked and you got to do the meeting on the fly in the coffee room with no presentation. Like, how do you, how do you talk through what we do and why they should care in five minutes or 10 minutes when the CIO comes in and, He's 20 minutes late or she's 20 minutes late and says, I only have five minutes. It's just a totally different world. Yeah. And, and people don't get that <clears throat> because if, if you're used to you doing a zoom or a, because it's usually pretty confined. Yep. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But when you're in person and they go, well, what? I'll introduce you to the CEO. Well, you better have something to say. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> That's happened to me. It's, ha it's oh. happened to me. And, and, you know, when I got into leadership at App Dynamics, it happened to myself and one of our really, really talented reps. Like we were in there with the CIO and there was a big deal going on where they were buying a company. And the president of that company was there and the CEO walked into the office and the president of the company they were acquiring walked into the office. And he looked at my rep and goes, what do you do? You guys are a great partner of ours, I hear. What do, what do you do? Talk to me. Right. And she was, she knocked it out of the park. It was great. Now, did you have somebody kind of help you through that process? Because, you know, in-person sales, especially when you're going in and not just talking to one person, or I don't know, if, was that a beauty contest type of sale where that they were looking at three to five vendors and you were one of them? Yeah, it was usually at BMC, it was, you know, us, CA and, uh, you know, Oracle. whoever else, right. Oracle is just the, the, you know, the monitoring solutions. Right. Um, but yeah, we had people help. Uh, a lot, right? My first line leader uh, at the time was a gentleman by the name of Tom Schmidt, who then went on to become the CRO of App Dynamics. He was helping me in every meeting, um, not so much handholding, but really just like as a you know catch hall. If I if I mess up, he can help or ask a question that I might have missed. Um, my second line leader at the time was this gentleman by the name of Dolly Reich, who's you know the president of Zscaler now and was the CRO of App Dynamics, and he he would do meetings with me first meetings. Right. It was just, uh, you know, really fun to see these guys, you know, they didn't have to do those meetings, but they, they were diving in and wanting to help a young rep, an impressionable rep that could have, you know, been flailing on his own, but instead had just all the support and, and great leadership. So, yeah. And w which of the jobs really kind of fit you and your personality the best? Um, yeah. So I, I love leadership. Uh, the most, um, I, I think it's cause of what I was, you know, taught and given by, um, you know, folks that I've been working with for so long. Um, but it's just to me, you know, helping people and, and reaching back and, and pulling up, you know, the next BDR or helping the next inside salesperson go be a, a sales rep or an accomplished leader, whatever it is. I just really enjoy diving in and, and helping and seeing where, you know, where I can add value to the team and the rep. Right. And does that come from like the soccer background? 
Um, it's, it's possible. I think it's, it's more, um, you know, my, you know, my mom, uh, you know, single mom growing up had to, you know, she was wearing many different hats and had to manage myself and my older sisters. And then my nieces who moved in with us and just, it was just a very busy, crazy house. And you could always, she did it very well and managed the house very well with empathy and, you know, still instilled a, a lot of values in, in, in her kids and her grandkids. Right. And I think that's probably where a lot of it comes from. Um, you know, we've always, uh, we've, we've all had a lot of help in troubling times and, um, it's just, you know, I learn from those times the most. Right. So my mom, I think was a big impact on me. And what do you think separates, you know, great salespeople from okay salespeople? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I think, okay, salespeople will go through the motions. Yeah. Um, so I, I always, I, in every job, especially in leadership, I've always kind of reframed and gone back to basics every, every quarter or two quarters. We'll, we'll like re, re check ourselves and make sure we're not getting complacent and comfortable. Right. I think reps that are okay are always just fine in their comfort zone. Yeah. Um, they'll stay at the mid-level technologist <laughs> selling features and they can be successful doing that's fine right it's nothing you know nothing wrong with that um i think the great reps are the ones that constantly are trying to learn more constantly are trying to uncover new pains and problems to solve are constantly thinking about what else can i be doing better who else can i help um and they're you know driving activity with purpose all the time right? it's not just pe pipeline generation on mondays it's pipeline generation you know every day of the week right yeah and what i like when you said like planning out the meeting. Yeah. Right. Because you're, you're going into like the shark tank essentially, right? Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Without knowing the sharks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You don't, you, you know, only what you've seen on the, you know, on the internet, right. right. Uh, you don't know what they're going to come at you with at all. And a lot of, and I had a manager who used to have the saying, let's see how it goes. And it's like, no, 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 no. We're not going to see how it goes. I didn't get up at four in the morning to fly here to see how it goes. <laughs> you know, let's, let's, exactly. let's exactly. play through. Who do you think cares? Where are they? What's going to yeah. drive them? What are we going to get for the next step? I had a, uh, I had a great leader, uh, Parma Paul um, on the West who used to help us drive um, question funneling per, per slide. So we would practice before, you know, a first meeting or a second or whatever it was. And we would, you know, every slide had to have a purpose and a reason. And you had to under, understand the why behind the slide. Otherwise, it was a waste of not just uh, your time, but your customer or prospect's time. And by the end of it, you'd end up having like only five or six very meaningful slides. Each one you had questions to ask to, to drive responses that you desired because you thought you could solve a problem. Yeah. Right. And you, you got that, it got to that level of detail, um, very impactful meetings that maybe went 30 minutes, but you, you know, really got uh, a lot out of it or your customer got a lot out of it. Right. Right. Because too many people think it has to be solely about personality and charm and rapport, but what creates that is what the client wants, not what you want to say. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and you get that deck from marketing, you know, every January, right? It's like the yes. 97 slides of gold. Right? Yes. <laughs> or, and then you, and then you would also, you run the risk of is you come up, you show up and throw up the deck and you think you had a great meeting and you could leave that meeting and the customer could leave that meeting and forget about you the second they walk out the door. Mm -hmm. And here you are thinking, I'm going to put, I'm going to put in my, uh, my Clary or in Salesforce, I got a V I got an opportunity. And then two weeks go by, three weeks go by, four weeks go by. You don't hear back from anyone. And now you just have this comfort VO out there, comfort pipeline that you, you're thinking you're looking at. It's great. Everything's great. It's not real. Right. And, and if you, you trim it down to the, the handful of points and you see what resonates and then you, you hold on to that and you make the rest of the meeting about that, when they're suggesting next steps. Yep, exactly, exactly. Instead of you going away, hey, I'll follow up in two weeks. And yes. <laughs> it's crickets. It, it's them saying, wow, they, they actually care uh, enough to understand my pain and my problem. They put themselves in, in my seat and they delivered a custom presentation tied to the pain and problem that they've researched 
I think I can a, you know, use whatever they're selling potentially, but B, maybe I want to do business with these people. Cause if they put this kind of effort into just a 30 minute or an hour meeting, like what are they going to do throughout, not just the sales cycle, but once the real selling and happens or the real relationship happens after I buy, right? right? Like how do they support me after I buy? Now, when you got into leadership, what did you look for in a rep? Um, so we look for, you know, high intelligence, character, coachability, curiosity, I think is a, is a huge one that puts into all of those buckets and then experience kind of as the, as the cherry on top. Um, yeah. And when you didn't see that, what, what did you do? Uh, when I didn't see it in a rep that worked for me or a rep that, uh, that worked for you. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> if they don't it. work for uh, you, it's like they're on their own. Yeah. So, so it's all about coaching uh, to me. It's, it's, uh, if, if I have, if I'm giving a ton of energy to a rep and they're not matching the energy, yeah. um, I think there may be an issue here, right? right? It's skill or will, um, do they have the skill and they're just not just willing to do the job? Do they have the will and they, they need to up level their skill set? So in that case, like I have all the time in the world for that, those people yeah. that'll, you know, maybe they want to run through a wall, but there's a door right there that they can just walk through, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, hey, let me help you, you know, show you where the door is and then how to get through it, right? Um, so I, you know, I, I'm, uh, I, you know, heavily involved in helping develop the, the teams and my leaders are as well. So we're very hands-on and trying to up level the talent. Um, and if we spot a gap, uh, we want to help that person be better. Yeah. <clears throat> and have you noticed any pattern in hiring of either background? Like oh, clearly your first hiring manager saw the soccer captain thing. Yes. Which just screams this person's going to be good at sales because the athletics I've seen, it's almost a hundred percent consistency, right? Yes. They've had to be yeah. coachable. They, they know what winning and losing feels like. So they're competitive and they know how to work together. Right. And there's, you don't learn that in school. You do not. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't learn it from a book. You have yeah. to experience it. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. What do you look for in reps when you're hiring them? So I, I, uh, there's a, a couple stories recently of reps that we've hired. Um, one gentleman, um, you know, started and sold a landscaping business. And we, we like when he got to me and we were in our final interview, I spent the entire interview on, on that and, and hearing the story of the why and, and the what and how he marketed it and how he built pipeline and who was his target audience and market. And, and then, you know, ultimately how did he build it? Why did he sell it? And I just yeah. dug into that piece big time. Right. And obviously he had been a successful seller in software already. He had, you know, five to eight years, not like the 20 to 25 years, but he had, he had good, good experience as well. Incredibly intelligent, how he built this company. And he also, you know, traveled a lot, right? And loves to travel. And just, we just dug into all these things that are just different to figure out how he thinks. And, and you can spot all these di different, amazing character traits um, along the way in, in this conversation, instead of just like having the, hey, tell me about your win, right? And talk, talk to me about a deal you won, right? It's just a different conversation because no one's going to bring you a deal that they, you know, a deal that was bad really right maybe they tell you a, a canned story about something they lost and then they yeah. and then ultimately it taught them something right but it's it's usually pretty canned but if you if you really dig into just these other stories i think you can find greatness in those stories and when you've what i've typically seen is you've got a, a lot of great brand names here have you looked for people with non-brand names We've, uh, we found some, we found some people, um, from different paths and, yeah. and areas. Um, so we just hired a woman from ADP, which is yeah. just a complete different, uh, world. But yeah. if, if you're successful there and selling, and it's just such a grind from what I hear. Right. And she's incredible. And we think she's going to be, uh, you know, on stage one day. Right. Um, I've hired people from earlier on in their careers when they're doing like monthly sales, selling ad software. Yep. Um, and then I actually tapped into their network and we hired, you know, three or four of the, that profile because it was such a, a, just like a crazy, this like they could close a deal on the phone, right? Like they could, they could close a thousand dollar deal over the phone. Yep. And that's just such a different world. I've never been in that world before. And it, <laughs> a hustle mentality was, was very present and they were so hungry. 
right? Because they had to be, they had to call, make the calls, had to do the research, had to do all that stuff. Um, and so just a couple different profiles that we've hired from, sure. Yeah, because when you hire like, because you went from a small company to a big brand portfolio yeah. company. Yes. And what makes yes. you successful there is, you know, a lot of it's getting the right territory at the right time and the right brand. And a lot of it's maneuvering internally ex as opposed to selling externally. Yes. Yeah. But then there's all these like tiny little startups where there's no brand recognition, no problem recognition, the product almost works and there's no marketing. <laughs> yeah. If you'll see after, <laughs> after the big brand, I went, I went to Sumo Logic, which was like, I was there very early. Uh, yeah. I opened up the Southwest. I didn't have a sales engineer supporting me in the Southwest for, you know, six months. Uh, right. And that was like, Hey, you have five States, go figure it out. You know? Right. <laughs> Because that's when you really kind of, you know, because you don't have when they, you know, BMC, there's a name recognition. They may not yes. know what you sell. Yes. <clears throat> when you sumo logic, is this a, are you going to show up and be 500 pounds and wear a diaper or what, what's going on here? <laughs> yes. No one, especially in a brand new market and you've got this Splunk gorilla in the room and no one knew what sumo was. Uh, it was, yeah, it was crazy. Uh, fun though, really fun. And so you built that from scratch? Uh, the Southwest. Yes. Yeah. I started, I, I had like Southern California, Arizona, Nevada, and some other things thrown in there uh, as well. So I think it was like 2,500 accounts, something ridiculous. It was like, how do you even start? Yeah. Right. It was, it was not a uh, true start, true early startup. And what advice do you have for people going through a career? Because you've had a very progressive career without any restarts. Right <laughs> yeah. Um, thankfully, right. Very, very fortunate, um, for that. So look, I, it's all about the people. Um, for me, it's, it's seeking mentorship constantly from, from new folks. Um, I mean, you, uh, you had me on this, this, uh, podcast here, right. Um, you're probably going to be getting some calls from me more, more often than you, than you want. Right. Uh, seeking guidance. I think, uh, it's something I did early and often in my career um, when I was a, a BDR. Um, I just noticed that there were all these great people around me. So why not go talk to them and figure it out? It's a lot like reading a book. Yeah. If people have, if, if the book's telling you, you know, how to do it, how not to do it, why not read that book? So you don't have to go experience it for yourself, right? Uh, why not go talk to all these great people that are definitely willing to give you their time? Um, I mentor a bunch of people myself. I give time back. Um, to them. And, and I still seek a lot of mentorship and leadership from a lot of people. And I think that's really helped me avoid, um, avoid the, the hiccups. I'm, I'm not on an island. I'm not a lone wolf running around. I, I do think we're all in this boat together uh, on my team and my boss feels the same way about it. Right. Um, so I think that's what I would, what I would tell somebody who's earlier on in their career. Um, and you also kind of fall in what I call the mafia strategy. <laughs> where you, you work for a great <laughs> boss and the great bosses tend to get the great jobs at the great companies. And what do they want? They want to bring the team that they know, trust and can execute with them. Yes. Yes. I have, uh, this is my third company with uh, several individuals at this company. Um, and I did uh, the Sumo Logic move was a, was a different branch from the same group, Mark Musselman was the, was the, you know, senior vice president at Sumo and he was off the Blade Logic branch as well. So it's just, I got very, very lucky and fortunate that the, the tree I landed on was, was Blade Logic to go meet all of these, these great people and learn from them. And, and the power of that is the relationship is already established. Yes. So, so the man, you don't have the, this the manager know what he's doing and does this rep know what he's doing and does this leader know what they're doing? That's all taken care of. Yes, it, it is. Um, it's, it's, it's cool, but you, to get there, you had to really, really perform. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I kind of, I screwed up in my career because I knew those guys and we had that went to the same beach house and they offered me this job. And it's like, and I just kept seeing the same pod going from one company to another, to another cooking the comp plan and the equity at each one of them. Right. And, and I was kind of more the lone wolf going, I know what I'm doing. I'll, I'll, I can figure out the, the winners and the losers and you can't. 
right? Because picking the winners is a big part of the career. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Because if you, you pick the wrong person in the beauty contest, you, you're like attached to them and yeah. it just doesn't work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and when can you tell if somebody's worth mentoring or, or just whining? Uh, if they're, it's a good question. Um, I've seen, you know, both, of course. Um, I think it's it, it, their persistence and then just how they ask the questions and what questions they're asking. So yeah. are they calling me to complain about like a, a comp plan issue constantly or, or something? <laughs> or are they, or are they like, Hey, Mike, I, you know, I would like to talk to you before I walk into this meeting and bounce a couple things off of you. You know, do you have, do you have 15 minutes, right? Um, Hey, can I grab 30 minutes to debrief with you on that meeting? Um, the follow-up with you. Um, they have a meeting with you, uh, a new business meeting with a customer or an internal meeting. They document a couple of great things or, or things they want to work on. And they send you a follow-up note and ask you for time. Um, and then you, all of a sudden you've got another two week recurring meeting every two weeks on, at eight o'clock or seven 30 in the morning. Right. Um, yeah. I think it's all up to that person seeking the seeking the uh, the guidance. Yeah, and how much do you think of it as mindset versus skill set? Is it? I think uh, mindset is the, it plays a bigger role. Um, I guess you, you skills you can be taught um, if you don't have the right mindset. Whether you know whether it's intelligence or character, um, you're not going to be coachable. And, uh, you know, you can, I can teach you, you know, the skills or our team can teach you the skills, um, and just show you that door instead of the wall. Right. Um, I've got, uh, you know, several stories like that of reps that just, we took chances on because we saw how hard they were working and how hard they would work for us. And, you know, it was hard, but got them to, you know, top tier level reps where now they, they're going and doing whatever they want at whatever companies they want. Um, and do you have a particular interview questions or, you know, so I, I actually like the one you start out with. Uh, it's pretty good. Um, I also, <laughs> I also start with, you know, Hey, what do you want to talk about today? Um, it's really, it's, it's a bizarre one, but it, it's really simple. It just keeps it super open-ended and I want to see if the person will take control of the interview, if they've done the research. And then from there, you can kind of branch uh, into many different, areas like do they want to take the whole thing and control it and run through you know why they think you know i i should hire them and what problem they can solve for me and um you know what what we're doing at, at this company at zscaler and how they can impact it um or do they do they just want to show up and throw up like a win story and a deal story right so <clears throat> and how about if i i flip it back to you when i go tell, describe the ideal uh candidate for this role it's great. You're starting to take control of the interview. I love that. Now I got to get a new question. <laughs> <laughs> Which worked for me probably 99% of the time. And as you <laughs> describe them, I'm playing with my tie and pointing to my face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's good. And usually it's the only question I have to ask during the interview. <laughs> yep. And it's done. <laughs> and nine times out of 10, they describe themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how about as far as like geography is there been a geography that fits your personality best because they're pretty diverse chicago is different than boston new york certainly uh manhattan beach <laughs> <laughs> i was uh i maybe was a little little too fast talking in in manhattan beach california i uh i think i think new york probably fits my personality a, a little better um i do miss manhattan beach absolutely beautiful town um Chicago was a great balance, I think, between uh, Boston and and, uh, and New York, um, and then obviously, you know, still pretty pretty hardcore Boston sports fan. But yeah. uh, miss my my family still up in Central Mass and all that stuff. So, and what advice would you have for you know somebody who's like that BDR early twenties, wants to be successful but doesn't have that mentor? Yeah, I. Uh, seek, seek it. It's all over the place, especially now. I didn't have, we didn't LinkedIn, I think was just starting, um, when I was at Blade Logic. Uh, so I had to, I was just lucky to have people right there that I could see and, and could know were great. Um, there's people all over LinkedIn that are incredible sales professionals. And I guarantee you would 
you know, take a meeting with you if you framed it the right way, just like you're, you're PGing into a customer, right? Um, and then, you know, work incredibly hard um, and just do the right things and then constantly try and be, you know, involved in meetings. Like try, try and, you know, if, if you have a rep that you've done really good things for and you've set meetings for, have them include you in, in new business meetings, yeah. right? And then maybe help them with their value pyramid. So you can start to learn a little bit about what it takes as a rep or ask some questions. What are the things that you need to do in your daily job that I can help you with? Exactly. Right? So I can just, so I can just start to learn and, and internalize that stuff. I had, <laughs> I had uh, a, an R, RSM at uh, Blade Logic fly me to Ohio and I ended up staying with his family for seven days. And he just drove me around to customer meetings from Ohio to Pittsburgh to Michigan to whatever. And it was just because I was persistent in asking him to get into meetings. And finally, he was like, dude, you want to just stay at my house? <laughs> I was like, all right, <laughs> really? You know, like, okay, great. But if, you know, if I wasn't doing the work for him uh, and then persistent about getting into meetings, he wouldn't have ever done that for me. Yeah. I think that leading with a give will work a whole lot more than the, yes. the, the begging for 15. It, it's all about the deposits, right? Yes, it it's, uh, you know, <laughs> Hey, give me, give me the five accounts that you haven't uh, maybe cracked into. Right. Let me, let me go build the value pyramids for those and an org chart around, you know, who and what and why, and I'll come back to you and let's get 15 minutes to work through it. Cause I'd love to understand how you would attack this account as a rep. Boom. Great. Yeah. Hey, really appreciate your time today, Mike. Where can people go to connect and follow you? Yeah, just Mike Ernest on LinkedIn. It's the best place, I think, to, to connect with me and, uh, and my team. And really looking forward to uh, you know, seeing if anyone reaches out. And uh, you know, thanks for hosting me. Appreciate it. Here are some of my takeaways from that interview. One is find a great company. <laughs> that that seems uh, overwhelming at first. And we have to have great judgment in our career. Because I look around, and I, I, I think I shared this with you a couple weeks ago, that I did an experiment looking back over my career and the people that I worked with and where they are today. Now, there's a long time period, pretty much a good back half of the career. And I was looking for patterns. I was looking for, you know, what, what clues are left there. And one of the things is if you got into a hot industry, you got into one of the better companies, and here people tend to think of the big companies. Uh, the big companies, they're, they're fine. I, I got acquired by a big company. The only problem is in the big brand portfolio company, you can get lost. And sometimes the job becomes how to work within the company versus with the customer. Now, if you go too small, you don't have the resources. It's all up to you. You're pretty much uh, an entrepreneur within a company. And if that's your type, and that's kind of what I did, uh, it's okay. And it works. If the company's product works and the market is almost there, because timing in your career is critical. Being there right at the right time, not too early, not too late. And a lot of this is hard to tell. One of the ways of solving it is what you heard today, is build up those relationships with the great managers. Now, if you can find a great manager at a great company at the right time, it's golden. Now, I understand that's all magic. Uh, but if you can judge it, much like you judge a deal, take the emotion out of it, think about it logically, get other people's opinions, because it's time. It's just as much as you sell, you're selling time. If you get into the wrong equation, the wrong aquarium, <laughs> as my friend Donald says, check that out on the B2B Revenue Show this week, what happens is the aquarium doesn't support fish like us. So it's a really a matter of finding the right aquarium for us. Both your skill set, where you are in your career, your network, your territory. It, it becomes kind of uh, that right fit. And that's one of the things I heard today. The other thing, what I really liked, is when you want help from other people, help them 
first. This is something that I think either last year or the year before I harped on, and it doesn't stick because as humans, we're just the opposite. We will reciprocate, but we don't initiate. We have to initiate because they're thinking the same way. They're thinking, I'm not going to reciprocate unless they initiate. So initiate, help somebody. And guess what? They're not always going to help you. Okay, that, that's, that's selling, right? That's life. That's human interaction. But sometimes they will. And, you know, I get hit on uh, 25, 30 times a day on LinkedIn with an ask. And I, I pretty much, all they had to do was like, comment, or share my stuff. And I, I probably would fulfill their request that w- is far awaited by the time they did hitting that button. You know, like I, I ask you folks, just like tell a friend about the show. You know, I put so much time and effort into this. That's all I ask. I, I, you know, a lot of people beg for reviews and beg you to buy a product. Yes, I'd love you to sign up for the courses if it's a fit. But if it's not, don't sign up. I don't want a bunch of whiners. I want uh, or what I call tourists, you know, people who come by, take a picture and then walk away. Sales is not tourism. Sales is engagement. Sales is digging in. So if you want mentorship from somebody, help them first. And guess who can help you the most? It's probably somebody who sold the product. Find that person who doesn't look, act, or feel like a a great salesperson, but they figured out how to sell it. They figured out that it's not about having the territory or the account or having a magical personality. They found out what the customer wants and how to keep that deal moving. The real uh, nitty gritty about the complex sale. Then you can build something from that. Now, I wanna update you on the courses because they're just cooking right now. Because it's not just content. There's plenty of content, probably more than you can consume in a year. But what you want is examples. You want interaction. You want community. You want to hear Q&A. You want to hear case studies. You want to hear long-form discussion of interaction between great reps, how people have solved it, the problems in different industries and in different channels and different contexts. Because this complex sale and prospecting today has changed. Now, the course is... People always ask, how long does it take to take the course? Well, the core content uh, in in wall clock time isn't that bad. It's becoming good at it. How long does it take to learn how to play a guitar? You know, it, it takes a couple of months to understand the chords and everything, but it takes a lifetime to become good at it. Do you think the complex sale is any different? That it's a performance and that it takes polish? So the year is about a year of commitment, a year of polish, a year of understanding and enlightenment, a year of connecting with other people. Because now that the audience is big enough, I'm connecting people who are in similar industries in different territories working in different, somewhat different markets so that they can build off of each other and customize the course to their particular audience. When you hear people go through these large deals step by step and preventing the things from going wrong, that's what it's all about. Because you can look back, and we should be looking back, and the big lesson is we're wasting 50% of our time. I talked to a CEO last week, and he told me he didn't have a sales problem. And I love when I hear that. And And I'm like, are you Amazon? Are, uh, what do you mean you don't have a sales problem? Uh, so you 300% a quota? No, 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 no. We made our quota. That's it? You have a sales problem. And I, I started to dissect it. I go, how many of these proposals close? Uh, 50%. Okay. So you, you're basically wasting half of every... But then you, you peel it back. You know, how many of the proof of concepts went to proposal? How many of the proof... The demos went to proof of content, and it kept going 50%, 50%, 50%, which means that about 20, 
maybe 10% of their time is well invested, and 80 to 90 is wasted. And this is not unusual. This is the norm. Because what ends up happening is people go, want the client to fit into their system. They want the client already anxious and acknowledgement of the problem and ready to buy. This is the time. If you don't become great at sales, you're wasting easily half of your time. Plus, you got to understand the other part of it. You got to take time off, right? You got the holidays, you got um, vacation, you got family emergencies, you got burnout, all of that stuff. There goes a month or two in aggregate over the year. And then you got the, the BS, QBRs, kickoffs and stuff. Yeah, some of it's good. Some of it's eh, not so good. That's another couple of weeks, maybe a month. And then you got the, okay, update me on the pipeline because I don't want to read it out of the CRM stuff. There's a day, a week, right? <laughs> Plus putting it in that they don't read. And all of a sudden, the amount of time that you really have to sell is so little. And then the effectiveness is 50% you got to increase that. If you don't, how much is that costing you? How is that going to feel? What do we, because we all think more of it is. Look back on the last quarter, the last month. And what I always used to do is I would make a copy of what my forecast looked at the first day of the quarter. And then I compared it to what closed at the end of the quarter. And it's shocking how different it is, that it is just this tiny bit that closes and all of this stuff that you work on. And it's like, where's my judgment? Where's my, how do I determine what to work on? Everyone talks about activity, but activity is assuming that each item has an equal likelihood of closing, that each one of these, uh, you just have to unturn the, the nutshell uh, to see if there's a nut in it. And if you do that enough times, you'll find that's the simple sale. The complex sale is just the opposite. Which one is most likely to have it based off of stage, people, uh, engagement? How do we put asset tests into our process to determine really where we are? Because guess what? They're telling us what they believe at the time, which is a feeling. And they are not professional game changers. You understand that the bigger the company is, the default is to not do anything. There are people who paid there at the company to make sure nothing changes, <laughs> to make sure nothing gets done. They're called bureaucrats. They get power by not doing stuff, not by doing stuff. And how do you work around that? Become great at sales. Because the B players, you know, I bet, talk to a friend, a B player who's unemployed. How are they going to get a job? A players, okay, you can probably get a job. You've got to be a maverick. You've got to be that person who can figure it out. And not in the MacGyver way, not in the paratrooper way, where under any circumstances, I know what to do. You've got to be knowing it. Like you, they wake you up and you understand how a deal works, not how you know how to escape while the bomb is ticking. That's, that's for the movies. The reality is we're professionals and we have to understand how companies buy. Not, hey, what's the magic trick, the uh, decoder cheat code to get this deal done? Everyone looks for the cheat code. And uh, I haven't found it, and I haven't found anybody who has found it. Some people are magical with their personality, and they might be able to charm somebody. I guess that's somewhat of a cheat code. But what I found to be the real thing is to keep the process going, to understand what's going to happen, to think through multiple steps in advance. Uh, the, the pounding on the phones and the begging and the pushing uh, it, it tends to work in the simple sale, not so much in the complex sale. Complex sale, many decision makers, uh, many decisions to make, uh, many steps, large dollar amount, more likely to stall than close. Let's get it to close. 
Check it out at b2brevenue.com. Do me a favor. Tell a friend about the show. If you see my content fly by on LinkedIn, a little like, a little thumbs up, a little comment, a little share would be appreciated. Check this out on YouTube as well. I got a couple of other podcasts, the Sales Leadership Show. Check that out. We hear the best sales leaders in the world. The B2B Revenue Leadership Show. How about that? More leaders. Sales questions. If you just like the tips and tricks, check it out. Seven days a week, I give the best tips in sales. We'll see you next time.